Hello, it's Andrew Homer again. Welcome back to another Chemistry Bite Size Revision session. Um, I want to look at a topic today which gives students a little bit of um, food for thought, quite a difficult idea to understand, so I'll, I'll walk you through this. I want to talk about polarization and how that can cause the thermal decomposition of group two metal nitrates. Right, well, there's a lot of terms coming out here, so I need to sort of build the picture up for you. Um, group two nitrates, magnesium nitrate, calcium nitrate, strontium nitrate, etc. Um, these are ionically bonded materials. Um, if we just look at this simple little model of um, ionic uh, bonding here, it's going to really help in this discussion if we don't worry about electron shells and what's going on in the nucleus. If we just think in terms of spheres, spheres, and we concentrate on the dimension, the size of the spheres, and on the charge. Okay, so just those two parameters, the size and the charge, are the key points here, rather than worrying about details inside. Okay, uh, metal ions are positive, so this is a metal ion. Non-metal ions negative. There is an electrostatic force of attraction between the positive and negative ions. S opposite charges attract, and those whole those ions stick together um, very, very strongly, and that's what we call an ionic bond. Okay, um, it's a very strong attraction. For example, these bar magnets, the way they clump together. I, I usually show students in class. Uh, I love these magnets. They're very, very strong and very effective. They will just clip together. Um, it doesn't just stop at one positive and one negative. We get a giant structure where the sodium, say sodium or chloride or magnesium and oxide, the bonding continues on and on and on, plus, minus, plus, minus. So this is perhaps the most well-known example students would be familiar with. This is sodium chloride giant ionic lattice. Sodium chloride, sodium chloride. It's a bit like a bag of sticky toffees. You know the way sticky toffees in a paper bag, if you're familiar with that? They all clump together and you can't pull them apart. Okay, so that's an ionic bond and the attraction between an opposite and negative charge. Right, what makes the ideal ionic bond? Um, these are perfect spheres um, which have no sharing of electrons whatsoever. They're completely separate from each other. So there's no sharing of electrons. What would make that ionic bond stronger? Things that will increase the strength of the ionic bond is if I have bigger charges, like two plus and two minus, um, that will make them bigger. And also if the ions get smaller as well, if the ions get smaller, effectively they're getting closer together and it makes the bonding stronger. So big charges and small ions give the strongest bonds. Okay, I mean, it's fairly un easy to understand if that was two plus, two minus, the whole thing is going to stick together much more rigidly. Okay, right, so what's this idea of polarization? Um, this is the next idea. What would happen if you start to heat a compound um, that has positive and negative ions in? We get a process starting to occur called polarization. Now, say, now this, this requires heat. Heat causes polarization. So if I've got a positive metal ion like that, it can start to distort the shape of the non-metal ion. Now let me get this really clear. It's the positive ion here that starts to pull electrons towards itself. Electrons in the non-metal ion, electrons are pulled across that way. The positive attracts the electrons in the outer shell of the negative ion. It couldn't be the other way around. You can't have a negative ion attracting electrons from a positive ion. It doesn't make sense. Okay, so this distortion like this, um, I sometimes say to students, it's a bit like one of those lava lamps, you know, those ornaments where you get blobs of oil that sort of start to sort of distort. The lava lamp, the way the distortion of the non-metal ion occurs there, that could, in extreme, could actually cause that to actually break up. The non-metal ion could break up and we end up with new materials. So polarization is this distortion, this breakdown of the nice clean spherical um, shape we've got there. Okay, if I heat group two nitrates, I get 
I get polarization occurring, and then the molecules will actually break down. And what I want to talk about next is um, what type of charges and sizes will cause most polarization, and then how that would apply to group two nitrates. In other words, which group two nitrates will, will break up more easily and which will be more difficult. Okay, there's a lot of points here. Let me take you through it um, a point at a time. Okay, so polarization then is this distortion of the positive ion pulling electrons towards it like that from the non-metal ion. Okay, I want to pick up that theme of polarization the metal ion polarizing the non-metal ion. Let me just look at these two scenarios here. Um, I've got a very small metal ion and a large uh, non-metal ion. The small metal ion, just focus on the dimension of this. It's very small and compact. Um, so it has what we call a high charge density. It has a high charge density. When I discuss this with students, they start to worry about what's going on in the nucleus and they worry about electron shells. Can you just think of that as a, as a golf ball that is very, very compact with all that positive charge compact into a small volume? Okay, so that makes the charges very compacted into a small space. And if it was two plus or three plus, it would be even more polarizing. Okay, now if I have a large non-metal ion, if you think of that as like a big soap bubble, it's quite floppy. The electrons on the outside of that can be quite easily pulled away and distorted towards this small metal ion here. So this is the best situation to get polarization. The densely packed charge in that metal ion there will pull the electrons away towards the metal there from this big floppy non-metal ion over here. So that's the best situation for polarization. If I look over here, if I've got a big spread out metal ion which has a low charge density, it's all spaced out, okay, it's, it doesn't have, it's, I sometimes describe it to students sometimes like a black hole, you know, if it's really, really compact, it's got enormous power, like the way a black hole can pull planets towards it, um, anything coming close by, it's got enormous gravity, right, sometimes get a bit carried away. This is not gravity, this is just little ions, little compact ions, but it can pull electrons towards itself. This much lower charge density particle here is nowhere near as effective at pulling the electrons from this non-metal ion. Okay, now this big floppy soap bubble, as I described, it is very polarizable, very polarizable. The metal ion does the polarizing and the non-metal ion gets polarized. So the bigger and floppier it is, the more polarizable it is. Okay, so very polarizable. So what, you, what we're going to get here in this scenario is, is complete corruption of the ionic bonding. We're not going to have our tidy little spheres. The whole thing changes shape. If you come over here, this low density ion here, um, tries to distort this compact little non-metal ion. Now the compact non-metal ion, because it's got a small radius, all the electrons are kept on a tight leash. They can't be pulled away very much towards this positive metal ion over here. So this small compact non-metal ion is not very polarizable. Okay, very polarizable, not very polarizable. Okay, small metal, non-metal not very polarizable. Okay, now we've got that concept in, in our minds about what causes the most damage to ionic bonding, that damage caused by polarization. Let's apply that to group two metal nitrates and let's see where the most polarization would occur because when we heat these compounds, that polarization is going to smash up the compound. It's going to break it up in the test tube um, because of polarization. So what students need to understand is which compounds in group two will polarize most easily and break up most easily and which will be the hardest. In other words, which are the most stable and which are the most unstable with respect to heat. So that's where I'm gonna take the discussion now. We've got the principles clarified here. Let's make the discussion apply to group two nitrates. Okay, so let's apply the theory so far to the thermal decomposition of group two nitrates. Um, before I develop that discussion, let's write the kind of chemical equation that could occur here. 
If you heat magnesium nitrate in a test tube, white crystals, it will decompose into magnesium oxide solid plus nitrogen dioxide gas plus oxygen, half O2. That's a balanced equation. Okay, the heat causes that heat will break anything up, any kind of compound. If you think about it, ionic bonding is the marriage between a positive and negative charge attracting each other. And if you apply enough heat, then they will break apart. So any compound will decompose if you apply enough heat to it. The question is here, looking at magnesium nitrate, calcium nitrate, and strontium nitrate, which will decompose the most easily and which will be the most difficult to decompose. Right, so I've got my little illustration here. I've also got some balls just to demonstrate that. So this is a big nitrate iron. Don't worry about the scale of this, but I've got a small, compact little magnesium iron. So remember this discussion we had a minute ago, we said that that small iron has a, what's the question? It's a high charge density, a high charge density. Okay, so it's very, very polarizing. That compact iron is very, very polarizing. The big nitrate iron is being subjected to that attraction by that compact iron there. If I had calcium ions, it is now bigger iron, bigger metal iron, and that's still pretty polarizing, but not as much as the last example. And then going down group two, obviously the atoms and the ions increase in size down group two. We've got more electron shells, but as I said, just worry about the, the spheres and their dimensions and, the, and their charges, okay? So the strontium iron is a bigger iron and so forth is, therefore is less polarizing, most polarizing, and then that's the least polarizing there. Okay, hope you can see that. If you've been following the discussion, you'll probably uh, discern that this compound will break up the most easily because that compact little magnesium ion will break up the nitrate ion more than that will. And that will be the least able to, to decompose. Okay, so in other words, this is the least stable compound and that is the most stable compound. So if I just write that trend down the side there. So the thermal stability increases so when you heat these compounds up, this will break up most easily, and this will be the most difficult, okay? Because that has the most polarizing compact little iron, that has the biggest, least polarizing metal iron. Okay, I had a student a couple of years ago, and she said, yes, I understand all that. She said, but I've got this real crisis in my understanding. Her problem was, she said to me, I understand that that small charge metal iron has the strongest bonding with this non-metal iron here. This small, compact little iron has got very strong bonding. Remember I said a few minutes ago that the smaller the ions, the stronger the bonding. Okay, and so if this breaks up most easily and it's got the strongest bonding, that doesn't make sense. This one breaks up more easily than that one and that, and that is least. Why does that break up most easily when it's got the strongest bonding? Strongest bonding, intermediate, weakest bonding. And I'm trying to think of, can I think of a way that I could rationalize the fact that it has the strongest bonding, but it breaks up first, okay? And then what I came up with is the idea, imagine the magnesium is hugging the nitrate iron, it's holding on, it's very, very strong. Now imagine the nitrate iron is a balloon full of water. So the question is, if I hug a balloon full of water strong enough, this is the one that's most hugging compared with that one. If you hug it enough, what will happen to the balloon? It will explode and break up into different particles. So this one's got the strongest bond, but that attraction for the nitrate ion actually ends up breaking up the nitrate ion. So it breaks up into the oxide, a gas, brown gas, and oxygen gas. Okay, so I think I resolved that conflict in the student's mind about the strongest bonding and the one that will break up most easily, okay? That strength of bonding actually causes the destruction of the compound. So I hope that's clear then. That's so the stability of the compounds increases down group, uh, down group two. So I need more and more heat. I'm, the question you might ask, why do you need heat? Well, you need heat because nothing's gonna happen without giving a bit of a kick to get the whole thing to go. 
the chemical in the jar is not going to do anything. But as soon as you give it heat energy, it will start to kind of do things. Polarization will start to have its effect when you heat these compounds up. Okay, so that is the least stable and that's the most stable. Okay, that completes the discussion about the thermal stability of group 2 nitrates. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so quite a few ideas thrown at you there. Let me just recap a quick summary on this. When we've got heat, heat causes small, highly charged metal ions to polarize the non-metal ions. Can I please keep emphasizing the metal polarizes the non-metal? This is distortion of the positive ion, the positive metal ion, attracting electrons in the non-metal ion towards the metal ion. Okay, uh, if you think about it, that attraction can cause complete disruption of the non-metal ion to the point where it will break up the non-metal ion into simpler products. If you were asked the question, what's, what's the simple definition of decomposition? It means breaking a material up into several simple, simpler materials. You're breaking up into simpler materials. And that's exactly what I've ha what's happened in this uh, situation with group two nitrates. It happens most easily at the top and least easily at the bottom. Okay, so that's covered it pretty comprehensively, I think. Thank you for listening.